Welcome to the Jiva Prologue to our current production, How to Catch Creation. Our prologues are lively and informative talks given prior to every performance of each Wilson season production. That can include background on the play's origins and or context, as well as the creative process that shaped the production. I am Rachel Day Guzman, producer of engagement programs at Jiva Theater Center, here to briefly welcome you and introduce our conversation list who will discuss the Black Arts Movement, a relevant context for the play's characters in 1966 and beyond, as well as the evocative notion of catching creation, ways it manifests and perhaps its relationship to the more contemporary concept of Black joy. We are so pleased the multifaceted artist and curator Terry Chaka joins us, bringing her expertise and experience to this chat. And we also welcome two fabulous How to Catch Creation actors, Libia Pugh, who plays Tammy in the production, and Cedric Mays, who plays Griffin. I'll now fade to black and let this unrehearsed, unscripted prologue conversation begin now. Nineteen sixty-six was the year that I went to school in Buffalo, New York. It was right, I would say somewhat in the beginning, the black arts movement was in full force at that time. And a lot of people won't acknowledge that that was a true movement, but it came behind the civil rights movement. It was inspired by some of the words of Malcolm X. Um, it was, probably best um, illustrated through the music of John Coltrane. And then came the, the poets. Uh, most people know Nikki Giovanni. Uh, some people may know Sonia Sanchez, Don L. Lee, who uh, later became Haki Matabuti. So there were many, many people that were creative that came through this time period. And because it, it was kind of limited as to uh, the audiences that they performed in front of and that they shared their work with, um, many of us were privileged to actually meet these people, these individuals, and also to um, share in conversation with them. So the developing of, of Black artists during the, uh, the Black arts movement was uh, an extension of that protest. And it was very, very different from the Harlem Renaissance in that the artist was not trying to prove that they could also perform and do art the same way as as white artists, mm -hmm. we were now deciding that we were going to define how our art should be and that it should reflect us and it should reflect our, uh, our, our heritage, our culture. And, um, and so some people saw it as kind of a militant representation of art but we saw it as being truth. You know, I, I love that because I'm, you know, I, um, I love the Black Arts Movement. I, it's, it informs everything that I do um, pretty much. Uh, the anthology Black Fire by uh, Amir Baraka and Larry Neal, which uh, began to set those um, precepts, yeah. those concepts. There you go, right there. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I have my copy. Um, the, 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 the words that these men and women, brothers and sisters, um, and everywhere uh, in between uh, were speaking about was how do we capture this, um, our voice, our culture, um, without the, um, the gaze, if you will, of mm -hmm. the majority culture. And within that 
comes, well, when working in that way, you attempt to, well, you don't attempt, you actually achieve a cultural specificity to the work, um, which, I mean, we'll obviously we'll get into that conversation about black joy and that kind of stuff, but I tend to feel that the concept, concepts from the black arts movement are sharply divided from what we consider black joy today, which I feel is a reaction to um, the majority gaze, as opposed to being a celebration of who we are for ourselves. But that's another discussion later on. Mm -hmm. um, Terry, you had mentioned, I agree with everything uh, that says, just Cedric just said, uh, my first introduction to the Black arts movement was through my mentor who happened to be a white woman from North Carolina. And she gave me Sonia Sanchez and I read some words that were very outrage us. <laughs> and I found myself feeling comforted in the fact that rage, uh, out, of ra out of rage, there comes a joy. I felt mm -hmm. joyful in the rage. Mm -hmm. Interesting because this play talks a lot about, uh, you know, even uh, Marche, G.K. Marche is one of the fictional uh, Black uh, feminists in similar to maybe Angela uh, Davis, um, who has a poem where she talks about Black rage and the joy that comes out of it, the creativity that comes out of it. And I found when I was reading Sonia and Mari Evans, and there was this, 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 this burning fire within me that went, yes, someone <laughs> saying it. And even when we went to see the brother, I forgot the name of the, um, the group that we saw. The Cedric. Okay, he was about. Mm -hmm. um, ethnic, yes. Uh, I want to make sure I get his name right. Um, ethnic heritage. Um, mm -hmm. he, he was saying something that really moved me and being around a majority white audience, he was saying black is back. Yes. And I remember thinking, I want to scream it. Mm -hmm. I want to say black is back, um, but because of the audience, I wasn't able to have that joy to experience that fire within that fire that is spoken of when it comes to, you know, what that, that the joy, like joy and pain is something that is constantly lived. I feel mm -hmm. um, when it comes to black people, especially artists. Um, so out of um, these artists, came this acceptance mm -hmm. of freedom, like you said before, before we started the conversation. And I just found that exciting um, mm -hmm. as I was learning about it in my twenties. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Frankie Beverly said, joy and pain is like sunshine and rain. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he comes from that, from that era too, and is still quite relevant today. Put, put on a Frankie Beverly piece and, mm -hmm you know, watch, watch the people have, you know, really rejoice mm -hmm. and have fun. Yeah. You know, there's um, my, I call it my home theater company, but it's just the theater company that I, I, I guess I came of consciousness with and of technique and style, style more so. Um, it was Penumbra Theater Company in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, which mm -hmm. is a theater company that was birthed out of the black arts movement. Yes. Um, and um, some of the major tenets of that movement are the art must be performed by, for, and the crucial crux of that all, near the black community. Um, yes. The idea that black folks have to, the, that, the, that the community is essentially the control, if you will, mm -hmm. for the images that are put on stage. I think so often what we find, and, and to this day, as well as back then, um, pretty much since the birth of this country, really, um, is the idea that the imagery that is depicted upon the stage, screen, or music is somehow, it goes through a gatekeeper who does not have the hue of the creator. So what ends up happening is you get work that is catered to the, um, the mores and the tastes of a different culture. Yes. Which once again, takes away that, that cultural specificity, that, that, that nuance 
mm-hmm. that the work needs to have. There's a reason why listening to um, a Cahill uh, Health Bar Ethnic Heritage Ensemble on a, was a Friday night, um, there was a reason uh, why, you know, and D- Daniel mentioned this, he said, he looked around at one point and all the black folks had our head, heads down and we were just shaking our heads and just there was, there was a, a soulful thing that was happening. Yes. You know, yeah. it, 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 it was a communion with yes. the experience. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, uh, others in the audience were kind of just blank stares almost. There was a conversation that was happening between um, ourselves and the artist. Not, and, and that's not to say that others cannot have that conversation or that same feeling, but you have to come in contact with what that culture is as opposed to your opinion of the culture. Um, and I think that once again, influences the work that is uncreated. It's, it's, it's what you call uh, ethos, Ooh, you yes. know, which is, which is, you know, the, the characteristic spirit actually of, uh, of a culture mm-hmm. and of the community. And um, uh, one of the things I, I think that when we were in this um kind of communing, if you will, with the, with the musicians is that, you know, having our head down and doing, I had to kind of block out the rest of the environment in order to absorb what was there. Yeah. Okay. And um, I don't know if, if other people realize that, that that's what they, that's what we do, but it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. What matters is is that we make that connection, and um, a, a lot of times we are forced to act as though we're making the connection with with the mainstream culture, mm-hmm. you know. And it comes off. I mean, we we understand it because we have to, mm-hmm. but we don't have to swallow it. Sure. If you if you understand what I mean. Which is, you know, this play, I think, is very important um, to these ideas that you're talking about, this connection between the audience. You know, we are a culture of call and response. Yes. And yes. when we have, you know, we're energetic, we're spiritual. And we are also, I was talking to Seth about this the other day, yesterday, um, you know, our struggle and our progress um, should be moving forward. And sometimes it gets stuck. And we look to, we've got television, you know, 1966, we had TVs, but, you know, theater is something that people probably weren't attending as much. And you look, look at it today, when you look at the audience today at a place like Jiva, and it's not just Jiva, it's mm-hmm. a lot of the, a lot of um, uh, nonprofit theater companies across this country, where you see, you see the same reflection in the audience. And when you have mm-hmm. black and brown people on stage representing, not colorblind casting right, right. of the other uh, races where we're asking to step, we're being asked to step into a role of people who were, were, would not have been normally played by us right. to have the opportunity to step into a role that is actually a black woman, real people living out real lives, complicated, the mm-hmm. complication of mm-hmm. our lives in this story. And all of us in some way trying to find creativity and yeah. catch creativity and mm-hmm. whether that comes in form of having a child as a black man who has been mm-hmm. incarcerated, uh, falsely accused of something he didn't do and served one life sentence, yeah. or a woman who is a, uh, I would say bisexual, uh, <laughs> in the play, who is also trying to find her way as a, as a painter, as an artist. Um, I, I often think that when you sit in an audience and you watch people on stage that look like you, there's this the desire or inspiration to want to go out and create something. And that's one of the things I hope that this show will one, bring in the representation of the people on stage in the audience. I hope that that happens. So we yeah. as black uh, actors can feel that, that spiritual connection. Like we yes. felt when we went to see the performance um, that's very important to our way of life mm-hmm. and how we communicate. And I also hope that, um, the effort of Jiva, which I'm grateful for them to put this show on the stage, um, that Black people see themselves and are inspired 
to, to create, because I think it's a missing link in our society within the black arts movement, through the Renaissance. And even now, like, I, w- I, I feel like I'm a part of a Renaissance. I, I started a theater company in Chicago called Congo Square in my apartment with people I went to school with and mm-hmm. uh, the company, I'm no longer affiliated with it, but it's still 20, it's 22 years old now. And that's a movement to be mm-hmm. able to have a company that long sustain itself within the climate, especially with COVID uh, happening. Uh, is a is a huge accomplish, accomplishment, and I think there are m- little movements going around, and we've seen it. We've seen it in Black Lives Matter. We've seen mm-hmm. it, you know, in all these different people who are coming up, who are trying to represent us, not just our struggle, mm-hmm. but our joy as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, you you mentioned um, hoping that the, the the audience would be more balanced. I know that. There's definitely a different feeling performing in front of uh, of a black audience. Um, they, we we talk to each other, <laughs> you know. So there's there's not this dead silence, and there's also a way of responding that you see that if people will they will laugh at certain things that perhaps other people don't laugh at. They will respond differently, yep. you know. And I think that that's that's really important. Um, just saying to talking about these these theaters uh, across the country, which many of them came into being. I know the African American Culture Center in Buffalo uh, started in 1968, I believe. So, uh, and these theaters are are still there. Mm-hmm. Um, many of them building their audiences. So, you know, there's there are more people perhaps attending the theater than than they used to, but there's still a large number of people who think that they have an idea that theater is something else or that um, going to a gallery is something else. You know, I'm a visual artist, but you know, I did some dabbling in, in theater and, um, and the world is, it's big, but it's so small because um, I think, with you all being uh, in in Chicago, um, and, and you certainly probably know someone who came from Buffalo, from the African American Culture Center, um, that I did some work with there, and he's been in Chicago for for decades at Loyola University, and that's Jonathan Wilson. Oh yeah, no, no. so you know, very good friend. So I got to do theater with him. Um, probably 1970, 72, perhaps, you know, very early on, you know, uh, when he was still a student or had just graduated. So it's, it's it, you know, the Black Arts Movement um, was very, very, very effective in, um, in helping people to think a different way about themselves. And so much was produced during that time Mm -hmm. that we really need to acknowledge it. Um, I know people try to push it under the rug and say, well, it wasn't really a movement. But for us, um, it was definitely a movement and it should be something that, uh, that people know about. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned something about earlier about um, black, I forgot my train of thought about black representation um, and oh about about um, people aren't used to this is what I would say people aren't used to seeing joy in black mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. you know it's like we struggle so much on on film and television and, and that's what the medium is for a lot of people but to experience this real love like it, it, as if it's militant. That's what I wanted to say. Okay. Black joy is militant. If I, if I'm <laughs> happy with who I am and I'm in love with a black man or a woman, mm-hmm. um, it, you know, if I if I express myself, and in that an expression comes out in anger toward the oppressors, mm-hmm. um, there there's this looked at as militant. Mm-hmm. 
And I just find that interesting that any, any, anything that a black person does that doesn't fit into a homogenized way of thinking that a black person yes. needs to be, it's looked at as militant. Now, I have been called that a lot in my life, uh, even by my family members, because I, black, you're all black. Okay, why am I <laughs> wrong with being black? You know, and and then this question again about being colorblind to casting, like I accepted that when I was auditioning back before the BIPOC came out and everybody's trying to be sensitive to the black community. Now, after COVID, there was a step back. I was like, wait a minute. And it just doesn't take mentioning, you know, what the land came from or, you know, the you know, black black culture and um, having these as parts of uh, our conversation. It takes actually doing it. It takes getting people in the administrative positions, not mm -hmm. just in the box office, not just custodians, not just house managers, not just the bar, not just the cook, mm -hmm. and not just on stage for a period of time doing uh, Black History Month. Mm -hmm. This is an ongoing, constant struggle, yes. and I have seen it in a, in a majority, and I've been at a lot, <laughs> of regional theater houses, and even in New York, where we think we would be more progressive, yeah. I've seen it in off-Broadway and on-Broadway, that struggle. It continues. See, Liz, I'm going to step away real quick. I'm hearing everything. My computer's kind of, the battery's draining. <laughs> oh, so slowly. Let me get my plug real quick. I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that, you know, the way that we express ourselves in, in black joy probably maybe confuses people um, because we know, you know, even talking about the the, the griot, that the name griot, you know, and instead of gelé, the name griot came about because uh, it means shouting that, you know, Europeans felt that this person was shouting, which mm -hmm. is the same thing that they may say about ministers in, in the black church, you know, the, the, um, the enthusiasm, uh, you know, that, that with which they speak and uh, the call and response and the response from the audience, it's, it's quite different, you know, and we have uh, black comedians who, who make jokes about it, you know, um, saying, you know, there's, there's a difference between the white church and the black church. It, it, I, I think it was, it probably was Richard Pryor that said that he thought it sounded like if you at a white church, you would think that, you know, you were kind of waiting on Dracula to come out, you know, <laughs> kind of like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> and the black church is different. And the same thing um, with going to an HBCU and, and seeing the, the, um, the halftime performance, you know, whereas at, at other colleges, that's when you go get your refreshments. Yes. Like, uh, uh, uh not for us. It's like, oh no, mm -mm -mm. no, I'll, I'll go get that later. I'm about to see, you know. So it's it's the way that we do things, and I think it's it's with so much. Um, I, well, we can call it joy, but it's it's with so much energy, mm -hmm. and. Um, and so it's so much uh, uh, commitment really to what it is that we're doing that perhaps it's frightening to other people, but we don't care. You know, that's the way that we like it. That's the way that we enjoy it. And that's the way that, that it always has been. And that's the way that it's going to be. So, you know, people need to get on the bus, you know, and join us. <laughs> they may learn something. You know, you know, I tend to think about it um, in terms of agency, right? I was um, talking to a friend of mine the other night and, you know, we I don't know how we got on the subject of slavery. I think we were, we were talking about movies and we mm -hmm. mentioned 12 years of slave, which I hate. I oh, make yeah. no bones about it. Um, I saw no agency mm -hmm. in it um, for an hour and a half, two hours, however long that movie was. I saw black folks just get beat on and degraded and demeaned. Well, if that were the case and black folks had no agency in that horrible period of our history, we wouldn't have survived. Mm -hmm. you, you, you would succumb spiritually to, yes. to, to, to that. And the fact is black folks, I, 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 I make a generalization, but across the diaspora, 
There is a, 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 a heartbeat, a spirit, a, a pulse, a something that, that keeps us thriving, even yeah. in the most horrible conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so once again, when we use that term, uh, black joy, I, I hear it interestingly, right? Because I don't believe black happiness, joy, creativity, any of that stuff has anything to do with an outside culture. It's who we are. It is not a reaction to something else. Yes. It is a constant within us. Um, and I think to um, consider it as a reactive or a um, revolutionary thing. Well, I, you know, and I, I, I try to be careful here because I don't want to um, limit or hinder someone else's feelings. You know what I mean? If, mm -hmm. if you feel that that joy is a revolutionary thing for you, then, hey, look, that's you. And once again, who, I'm, I'm not here to judge that. What I am saying, though, is that I believe that there is, there is that thing, whatever you want to call it, which allows one to exist on their own terms mm -hmm. and on their own grounds and on their own spirit. We are a communal people, but we also are individuals as well, right? And I just, I, I just tend to believe that that stuff, that's the good stuff. That's the stuff that others seek to emulate. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's why rock and roll yeah. started, you yeah. know, with black rock folks. But then, you country, know, country. You know, all, yes. You know, yes. I, I'm looking at the history of country music and yes. jazz, you know, blues, you know, those, mm -hmm. those, those the instruments, the, the banjo, the violin, the, yes. all of these instruments that are now connected to European culture and classic, mm -hmm. you know, these, these, these um, labeling of what's classic and what's not. What's classic to you may not be classic to me based on my experience. And right. as I said, I want to speak on, you know, when you talked about 12 years as a slave, I thought about um, how essential music was and humming and hymns mm -hmm. to the survival, to the to bring the joy again out of the pain. Sure, yeah. I remember my grandmother being in the kitchen and mm, and sitting humming because she would have an argument with my, with my grandfather and she just had all this burden on her. And the only way for her to release is to sing a gospel song or sure. hum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we needed that. And I think we need it more now more than ever. Mm -hmm. We need it now more than ever. And we need live theater more than ever. I think it's essential. Yes. I went to Florida a and University and, and I was one of those halftime. I did not come to see the football team. I came to see the band or <laughs> the marching 100, which is really 300. And, and our theater was called FAMU Essential Theater. And that word essential is so important as I look back on my life uh, to the appreciation of our own culture. If we don't see art as essential, mm -hmm. someone else will take it like jazz has been taken, like ragtime has been taken, like all of our, our, our blues are now being um, assimilated into other cultures. I, I see a lot of uh, Japanese um, uh, jazz musicians in Harlem, like, wow, the culture goes beyond, it's so, it just travels and travels, but the root of it is us, is Black people. And I think that we were, we were saved by art. Oh. And I hear you, mm -hmm. Cedric, when you say, when you talk about joy, like what, what is that? It's, it's so, it's a lot of other things underneath that joy. Mm -hmm. And so that joy is the, is the release. Yes. The, yes. the uh, energy release, the, the back and forth energy between a common, common culture. And, and we're not all the same, you know, Seth oh. and I come from the South. I'm from oh. Florida, South Carolina. I'm not sure where, Terry, where you, if you grew up upstate. Right here. Right here, right? <laughs> and, you know, we're from different regions and from different countries, but we share a commonality yeah. uh, of spirituality. Yeah. I mean, things that made me think of something just now, um, when you talk about art, in the first essay in that book of uh, Black Fire, mm -hmm. um, the essay has said something that has just stuck in my heart since I read it years ago. He makes a point to say that... Um, in the African traditions, 
we never created our gods out of stone and steel. Yeah. We created our gods out of stick, straw, and mud. So when the rainy season came, you physically had to remember your gods. So there, there, there was a constant evolution of what um, came before and what is happening right now. And I think that's a perfect way to look at black creativity, you know? There's a reason, I, 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 you know, in that, that new Tina Turner documentary, which I, I recommend everyone watch, it's so good, it's on HBO Max. But, you know, um, it talks about Ike Turner and how Ike Turner was literally probably the first person to write a rock and roll song. But then everyone kept, you know, he, he would put, a, put an act on and then they would take the money and run. And so he never got the credit for it. I'm, I, make, I make that point because black folks are interesting, right? You know, okay, we create rock and roll. Then we say, you want it? You got it. Take it. We'll do something else. Uh, you know? And then, and then we create a new art form. And then a new art form. And then a new art form. Because we, are, we, we, we just have that, that thing that continually is able to create something else. But I will say, and it circles back kind of to the play a little bit, because um, there's a question of um, the character Stokes asks, I wonder how is GK living in this, retirement home or whatever. Like, does she have family? Da, 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 da. I'm thinking, no, she probably just made money. You know, she sold her books and her poetry. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the question then becomes, and this once again circles back to um, the idea of working in, you know, majority spaces, these kind of things, and how you make money as an artist. Yeah. It's a, it's a tricky thing, right? You know, yeah. you want to do mm -hmm. this specific work that celebrates your culture, but then sometimes, the places that are doing that don't have the budget. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey man, I wanna travel the world too. You know, so you, you know, I, I wanna buy a house. So you mm -hmm. have to work in spaces that have that budget. Um, and it's, it's this balancing act that black artists have to do sometimes of, you know, creating art, but also creating a life and able to afford, you know, to live comfortably, if you will. Yes, yes. And, that, and, that, and that's very, that's very complicated. Yeah. And that's very been ongoing. And, you know, I, uh, I, I stopped acting for six years, not stopped, but I stopped, I was off stage for six years in, in order to take a job teaching high school in the Bronx. And I quit that job to come do this show. Uh, and I feel like, you know, stepping away and coming back, I did that because I had to pay bills. I couldn't, I was turning, I was in my 40s. I was like, oh, you got to start thinking about all these other things like health insurance that you cannot get unless you do a certain amount of equity shows. And mm -hmm. so you have to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I did that. But then, you know, after remote learning and COVID and teaching and what happened with teachers, I was like, I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. My joy is in the theater with yeah. these people. Every day I come to rehearsal around these people who some of them, two years since COVID happened, haven't been on stage. That's Black joy to me. <laughs> 